any idea how many patients have been treated with the balloon cap? I, I hard have, to keep score, right? Yeah, I, I have no idea. Yeah. But it's got to be tens of millions. Yes. Yeah. yeah. How does that make you feel when you think about that impact that you've had? It makes me feel good. Almost every surgeon in the world has at one time or another shouted, get me a Fogarty. That's not taking Tom Fogarty's name in vain. They're asking for this. This simple balloon on a catheter, which has been one of the most transformational medical devices in the last 50 years, is but one of the many developments and accomplishments that we'll celebrate Dr. Fogarty's career with in this video. So Tom, we'll start at the beginning. Tell me a little bit about the Cincinnati years and school and being a troublemaker and uh, staying out of jail and anything else that comes to mind. Well, how do you know I did stay out of jail? Uh, well, that, now's, the time, now's the time to set the record straight. Being brought up in Cincinnati for me was a great experience. I spent my, most of my time uh, on the wrong side of the track because uh, I enjoyed it more. In the neighborhood when anything was missing or things were broken, they knew where to go. It was to my address. Getting in trouble was a very good learning experience. What did your parents think about the troublemaker component? Well, my dad uh, was gone by the time I was seven. He uh, essentially was a victim of post-traumatic syndrome. He was in the First World War. He was a platoon sergeant, and about two-thirds of his platoon was wiped out. He was a survivor. He left to go to the war, a very vital human being, and came back uh, essentially not so vital, became an alcoholic, and so he wasn't around much. So my mother was my first mentor, mm -hmm. and uh, she taught me a lot. What was your mother like? She was a very tough German lady. She had to be. I mean, uh, having three kids, very little finances. In those days, uh, women, when they worked, they were paid very little. And she was actually worked in a sweatshop, a dry cleaning store. And she did everything from the accounting to the billing to running uh, the steamer uh, to doing the sewing. and. Uh, Whatever was needed, uh, she did it. And she had you fix some things around the house, too. Is yes, that right? yeah. Well, and I, I kind of <laughs> like to do it. Uh, you know, I, I just like to fix things. I once heard you describe yourself as a pugilist, a fighter. When did you start your boxing career? Really, when I started boxing seriously, it was a summer camp to keep me out of trouble. They really taught us how to box the proper way, so I became pretty good at it. We'd box, and uh, you got a part of the purse if you won. So I liked to win, and I was having fun winning, so I decided I was going to be a boxer, and that was my path all the way through high school. The balloon catheter is not your first invention. Can you tell us about the centrifugal clutch, please? In the neighborhood, there was only uh, one family that was uh, relatively wealthy, and he was a uh, dentist. And I became very friendly with his son, uh, who was kind of a what we called back then as a pinhead. A pinhead was a nerd. And this guy was tall, very gangly, and uh, very withdrawn. But he had a Cushman motor scooter. And so, you know, I liked mechanical things, and it was fun riding on a scooter. The problem was, back then, they were all mechanical clutches. 
And so when you would be going up a hill, and you were in high, you had a shift into low. And I was on the back of that scooter all the time. And the back sloped down, but on the middle of the slope, there was a big backup light that was about the size of your fist. And so when you shift from high into low, it would jerk ahead, really jerk. So you, I'd find myself on the street sliding off that slope. And on the way down... You hit the taillight. I hit the taillight, and uh, that caused considerable pain and discomfort. And uh, I said to Pinhead, we got to stop this. We got to figure out how to make this transition much smoother. I worked in a machine shop in a gas station. I cleaned up the machine shop after work and Pinhead would come down. And uh, we learned how to use some of the tools with their permission. And that led to the development of the centrifugal clutch. Any small motor has usually some form of centrifugal clutch on it now. But at that time, uh, I didn't know anything about intellectual property. But what I did learn, if you work in a facility, you use their instrumentation and time to create something. They own the creation. It's called shop rights. It's very similar to what goes on major universities. Right out of the eighth grade, I got a job at Good Samaritan Hospital, an orderly, and I did all different kinds of things. And they were interesting things for me. At that time, they reused all needles. They were stainless steel. Uh, so you had to clean them, and you had to resharpen them. So I learned how to do that, which I, you know I enjoyed, and it was a way to make money. It really got me interested in medicine. Is that where you met uh, Jack Cranley? That's where I met Jack Cranley. He saw me rolling the oxygen tanks into the rooms, and the oxygen tanks were bigger than me. So he said, "What are you doing here?" And I said, "Well, I'm working." <laughs> so because that's what I was doing. Uh -huh. One of the priests convinced me, and Dr. Cranley, who's my mentor, convinced me uh, that I should use my brains for something other than getting them knocked out. And so I thought, well, that's a good idea. Jack Cranley was a, uh, one of the first surgeons to really dedicate his practice to vascular procedures. So it was very exciting to see new things. And I saw a lot of things that didn't work. And, and one of them was uh, when you hit a blood clot, how do you get it out? There are usually three or four procedures. They would go back for a third operation, which was usually an amputation. And I would see all this as a scrub technician. And Dr. Cranley says, you know, this isn't working, isn't it? And I said, no, it's not working. He said, well, why don't you do something about it? I said, I, you want me to do something about it? And he said, yeah. And uh, I said, well, you got to help me. And he said, okay. So that was the origin of the balloon catheter. You were fiddling around in the attic with ties and, and, and taking the end of a glove off? Yes. Yeah, it was very simple. I stole a ureteral catheter. Yeah. And I took a number five glove and I cut the fingertip of the baby finger and um, tied it onto a ureteral catheter. When was the first time you used it clinically? 1959 or 60. Was this when you were with? Cranley. Cranley. Did he like it? Oh, yeah. You know, there's certain phrases that happen when you really observe something interesting and his comment was, oh shit. <laughs> Meaning it really worked. 
it worked. And you made those catheters for quite a while. I made those catheters for quite a while because I could not find a manufacturer to help me. I did it myself for about two years. When Where? I was in my room. You know, it's a kid, essentially, acting like a surgeon. And they said, this is crazy. That kid doesn't know what he's doing. Here's a quote from Dr. William Ogmeyer, a real, a very prominent surgeon at that time, who said, a dangerous and inappropriate procedure. Only one so inexperienced and uninformed as a student would dare think of this. The entrenched standards resist disruptors. Absolutely. The Bloom catheter could not get published. I think we went through every major journal. You're ruining a perfectly good operation. A classic disruption that nobody wanted until everybody uses. We are taught in the field of medicine to protect the patient at all costs and the way to do that is do what you've always done. And if you don't do that you're deviating from the standard of yeah. care. If you deviate from the standard of care your chances of getting sued are pretty high. So there's real incentive not to explore things beyond what you've been taught. The greatest deterrent to innovation in the field of medicine is displacing the old. Mm -hmm. The old technology, mm -hmm. the elderly people, yep. the habits that have been established, mm -hmm. and peer pressure from above. What did you think about the environment in Silicon Valley? I loved the environment. It was all exciting. Everybody was doing something new. Medical technology was really not very prominent in Silicon Valley when I came here. The value of medical technology uh, here came from others that migrated into Silicon Valley. And a lot of it came from South, Orange County. Yeah, yeah. Edwards Labs. And yeah, Edwards Lab was a big one. So a lot of the things that I did, I did with Edwards, but up here. What was the insight that led to the development of the tissue valve? The insight really came uh, out of Edwards. The ball valve was fraught with a lot of problems. One was durability. The other was, was clot formation. So people were required to be on Coumadin, which was bad. The concept of a tissue valve came up, and Edwards didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, why was that? The ball valve was the valve. There's no yeah. other valve available. Yeah, yeah. So that was a, a source of revenue to the company. If a company has major market share, to expect them to adapt something that'll put them out of business is wishful thinking. You're gonna have to have a company that has vision. You know, innovation really, the first step is imagination, and the last step is commercialization. It does no good for anybody unless you can commercialize technology. And that is a very difficult step, unless you've been through it. When I see a problem in the field of surgery, I make the engineers go in and see an operation, a standard operation and what we're trying to improve about that operation. And it's amazing what they'll come up with. They'll come up with something that you totally miss. Because as a trainee in the field of surgery, you're trained to do things a certain way. And doing the same thing the same way all the time conditions you to not think beyond that. But if you have a fresh thought come in there and that thought comes from an engineer 
really consider that thought and respond to it. What are surgeons' biggest failings when they try to work on those teams? Their ego. They think they know everything. Well, they don't know enough of anything. So you need other people and you have to respect them and really listen to them. So 10 years ago, you started the Fogarty Institute. That's 12. 12. <laughs> Time flies. It does. Being exposed to the VA, the NIH, not-for-profits, profit, and what I was exposed to at a young age, I wanted to replicate. That's incorporated in what we're trying to accomplish at the Institute. Innovate with the purpose of benefiting patients. Uh, the Fogarty Institute may be your biggest contribution because of the multiplicative effect of all of the young people and the technologies that will continue for the rest of their lifetime. You know, it's that pebbles in the pond, the ripples just go and go and go. Yes, yeah. That's why mentorship is so important. And that's what makes this field so rewarding. It really does. I mean, you multiply the efforts. I think we're going to have some technology that's going to be transcutaneous. Uh, it's probably going to be some forms of energy. The gamma knife and the cyber knife are two great examples of blading something and not having any punctures or incision. My experience is probably much like others who innovate, observe a failure. So just observing what doesn't work and then conceiving of something that may work and being encouraged to implement something that would work and aiding somebody in that implementation is critical, it has been critical to my success. It's, and part of that is just being curious and asking questions like why. Thomas J. Fogarty. National Medal of Technology and Innovation II, Thomas J. Fogarty, Fogarty Institute for Innovation, for innovations in minimally invasive medical devices.